anyone who's a participant in the sector should hopefully find the site um, useful. But perhaps of, of more importance when we're when we're dealing with with regulators, whether they be at the, the DTIC or the police or anywhere else. Um, We would like them to have access to reliable data when they formulate their own policies or when they wish to to measure those policies. Um, You know, this is a brand new initiative and we'll have to see how it develops. But I guess at the heart of all of this is that when uh, people are interacting, and we don't, of course, know how many of those interactions happen, But when somebody is in a meeting with, uh, for example, someone from the security cluster, it would be useful to have that conversation be based on hard data rather than two people um, telling each other what they think is right and both potentially being wrong. I think we'd we'd like to be putting um, more data up on on things, uh, for example, like the, the very large value transfers that happen within the scrap metal sector. So for example, um, when somebody generates scrap, let's say an automotive producer, um, that scrap is sold locally at at quite a big discount. Um, At the moment, by the way, that's around 35%. And we'd we'd like to do more analysis on what is happening with that 35%. Um, Our back of the cigarette box calculation says that amounts to somewhere around 8 billion rand a year being transferred from the big producers to the the downstream consumers. And we'd like to do more analysis on that. We'd like to understand um, how investment flows are connected to these policies. So, for example, there appears to be um, a situation because of these, these policies that give preferences. There appears to be overinvestment in the sector and so we begin seeing some of these mini mills um, failing. So a few have gone into liquidation or business rescue, but there's certainly some pressure in that sector. We would like to understand how much of that is caused, for example, by those, those very large distortions um, in the market. And when we saw some of this just with uh, ArcelorMittal saying that they were going to close down Newcastle, fortunately, they've walked that back that decision. Um, But at least a part of that, if we go back to November last year um, and and their CEO identifies this is a problem, these export duties on scrap, the PPS, the subsidized um, costs that are being covered, cheap finance, et cetera. And then we end up with this overinvestment. And that's certainly not good either if you're one of the people whose capital is exposed. I think we've got a very weird situation. Scrap metal doesn't really behave like any other product. Um, So as demand for any product rises, um, until the supply rises to match it, the prices would would normally go up. Um, What's happened here is the demand has been artificially inflated because you you have friendly finance terms out of the IDC. And you've got these discounted discounts kind of guaranteed on your raw materials. Um, And if somebody doesn't buy the goods locally, then the exporter still has to pay an export duty. So all of that creates this extra demand. The problem is nobody sets up a factory to produce more scrap metal, which means the amount of scrap in the market is really determined by the state of our economy. Um, And so what's happening is you've got the increased demand because these terms are very friendly. You can't increase the supply. And at some point, that means some people are going to run out of money, presumably, or you're just not going to be able to buy enough of the raw material. And because you can't put more of it into the market, it creates this precarious um, situation depending whose numbers you use, but the DTIC um, a couple of years ago said they thought that there was somewhere between 250 and 300,000 people who are waste pickers. And even though by volume, they they don't account for a huge portion of the scrap metal collected, um, in their lives, it's obviously a very big deal because there isn't any other form of scrap that generates an equivalent amount of income. So anything that interferes with that you know, has the potential to harm them. You know? But the flip side of that, of course, is you, you don't want to create a situation 
where you can hide behind the fact that these are, are waste pickers, but they're actually stealing you know, infrastructure. So I think that's the kind of balance that these rules are trying to achieve. Um, I think, you know, the, the the recycling sector for years has said things like you need to stop people trading scrap metal in cash because it's problematic. Um, but there are, also, there are also kind of other systemic problems, which I think are still not being addressed. 